Nation. There we have joining us Eugene Kawamoto, Director of Product Management from the Redshift team. Eugene, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, nice to meet you, Nick. Thanks for inviting me to this show. Well, we're happy to have you. And I know Rob gave his really quick elevator pitch for Amazon Redshift, but I think you might be able to do it a little bit better. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Amazon Redshift for those that may not be familiar with it? Yeah, just uh, for the basics, um, Redshift is a data warehouse built for the cloud. So a data warehouse is basically a central repository of information that customers, you know, such as data analysts, can make informed decisions. And Redshift is really specifically designed to deliver high performance at any scale. So from small amounts of data to petabytes of data, also with large number of concurrent users and queries. You said uh, central repository of information. It sounds like a database. Can you kind of help us understand where the, the line is, if there is one? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Redshift is really a purpose-built database that's designed to do analytics. So it helps you derive insights with really large amounts of data. And you know, this is you know, you know, various different use cases like business reporting, odd hack analysis, dashboarding. So it's really you know, all, all over the board in terms of analytical use cases. And this is different from what we call a relational database that might be designed for you know, transactional processing. So for example, uh, these are databases that process transactional information such in you know, an e-commerce site, you might have a database that processes you know, customer purchasing activities. And at AWS, we provide you know, different data services for different use cases. So Redshift is part of this portfolio of purpose-built data services. And we also have multiple different types of purpose-built you know, services. You know, some examples are like Aurora, uh, relational databases where we provide different type of flavors like PostgreSQL and MySQL. We also have DynamoDB, our flexible NoSQL database that really performs at any scale. And we have big data processing services like EMR that easily runs open source frameworks like Apache Spark, Hive, and Presto as a managed service. Yeah, uh, families, tiers, those are different ways we describe differences in databases, engines even. But I think flavors is, is my new favorite go-to word now for describing the different options customers have. Um, but what I'm hearing here is that there is uh, obviously the storage of data, but then this real necessity around how we can perform compute and analysis against that data. And it seems that that's where a solution like Redshift sort of comes into the fold. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this data gets transported to other services, either how it ends up in Redshift or how Redshift then exports that to other services that customers, customers may have in their analytics pipeline? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, what we really see right now is, you know, customers want to be able to analyze all their data. And, you know, it, it's really one of the key tenants that Redshift has right now. So with, you know, analytic services overall, uh, we try to make it easy to move and share data and provide the easy integration between these different uh, AWS services. And what we call uh, this is the Lakehouse architecture. And really, Redshift is built on top of this Lakehouse architecture to make it easy to uh, move data, but also integrate with different services as well. So uh, you really have a choice between loading your data locally into Redshift or querying data into place. So for loading and transforming data, we have you know, various different options like AWS Glue, uh, Kinesis Firehose, or simply using like a copy command to ingest data for S, you know, from S3. And you also have options to query data in place without really loading uh, data, uh, loading data into Redshift. So a good example is Redshift Spectrum. So it's a service that's been out here for about three years now. It's a very popular, popular way to query uh, against data directly in your S3 data lake. And we also have things like federated query, where you can query data in Amazon RDS and Aurora Postgres SQL stores as well. And you know, we also integrate with other uh, services. And we recently announced um, integration with Glue Elastic Views. It's a service that's in preview right now that enables you to synchronize your data between Redshift and source databases. So. This gives you really the choice and flexibility, and you can load you know, the most often access data uh, into the local Redshift red data warehouse for high performance. 
and you can take advantage of Spectrum in federated query to enable your users to access other less frequently needed data. Got it. So the description you're, you're giving us so far is that Redshift is this kind of place where you can consolidate your queries across multiple different data sources, silos, integration points. Does that sound roughly correct to you? Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much accurate. Yep. So is for my edification, is this uh, that seems like a read-only workflow, these analytics workflows, these read-only workflows. Is that is that correct as well to say that the primary use case here when you're running analytics, uh, you're mostly reading data, you're not necessarily writing it? Um, you know, I think it's a multiple different type of things. Um, there's both read and write workloads that we do enable as part of Redshift, but I would say the primary use case, you know, for you know data analysts, data scientists, is really to read the the data and you know large amounts of data that's stored within Redshift. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to reading data, I, you know, I think there's you talked about all these different use cases, um, and I imagine. You have all sorts of different tools once you start to get to the scale where you need a data warehouse. Uh, how do they how do they get at that data? I mean, what, what tools do they use to analyze this stuff? Yeah, there's um, really multiple ways to access this data uh, with various different tools. But I would say the most basic way to access Redshift data uh, and to do analytics is connecting through a JDBC and ODBC driver using the tool of your choice. So. Uh, we support various different tools um, and, you know, very popular tools are things like BI tools, uh, Tableau, uh, Power BI, uh, as well as open source tools such as, you know, SQL query editors. So, it's, you know, it's really uh, dependent upon the user's choice in terms of what uh, tools they like to use. And, you know, by going through these tools, you can use SQL uh, to perform multiple different operations and querying both structured and semi-structured data. And we recently announced a new data type called Super, uh, which we'll talk further today, which I'm super excited about, uh, which really enables you to query semi-structured data, uh, in particular, JSON nested data locally within Redshift. So, um, and we also have other features like Redshift ML, uh, which makes it easy to um, create, train, and use SageMaker machine learning capabilities in Redshift through a SQL interface. So. And uh, there's also various different capabilities like data API that we launched, uh, I believe in September of last year, which enables you to access Redshift through code. Yeah, this is, this is all super fascinating. I mean, just bringing the data together to then perform analysis on top of that. And what it really sounds like is we're expanding the breadth of data types with the super data type, which I know we're gonna hear um, from someone about in a little bit. Um, but then also just expanding and, and lowering the barrier of entry to perform machine learning against that data. Again, announced a preview at reInvent. Um, so, so really just unlocking the value that exists in this data with a number of um, these features. Now, you talked about Redshift Data API there on the tail end. Could you go a little more in depth on that? Because that sounds really exciting in terms of what customers can probably do with that. Yeah, we're uh, we're actually super excited about um, Data API. You know, as I mentioned, it's a it's a relatively new service we launched in September, but it's really taking off. Uh, we have more than five thousand customers that are already using it with multiple different type of uh, workloads. And really, what Data Data API makes uh, is it makes it easy to access your data from a web based service uh, application. So ne no need to configure drivers. You simply call a secure API endpoint provided by the data API, and the data API, you know, takes care of managing the connections and buffering the data, uh, those type of things. So you can really, uh, you know, you know, do various different things. And we also support multiple different programming languages and platforms supported by the West SDK. So Python, Go, Java, Node.js, Ruby, C++, um, you know, programming language of your choice. So it really provides a lot of flexibility in terms of accessing Redshift through different type of applications. That sounds incredibly useful for creating all sorts of integrations, be it from visualizations to scripts to, to anything in between. Now, you said that the... Uh, it supports all these different languages in terms of SDKs. Uh, I mean, maybe we, um, well, I don't think this is one of the sections. Maybe we should have uh, added another section for a deep dive into data API, but um, maybe you can talk very briefly about this. Uh, what, what is it actually like to use the data API? Is it 
you know, you, are you passing in a, a SQL query and then uh, there's a SQL driver there or is it more opinionated? Yeah, um, you know, it's, you know, um, it, it essentially enables you to, um, you know, enable, you know, SQL through, uh, you know, programming, programming languages and enables um, a, another alternative way of accessing your data, um, you know, convent, you know, previously, you know, you had to access Redshift through these drivers, uh, which I explained like JDBC, ODBC drivers and various different tools, but uh, really data API makes it easy to access it through programmable type of languages through an API. So really that has taken off. We've seen uh, customers in various new type of industries and especially in like areas like FinTech, startup, digital native companies building applications to access their Redshift uh, data warehouse. So super excited about it. That's awesome, Eugene. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, what are the areas of, of investment for, for Redshift and uh, what are we talking about today? Yeah, um, you know, there's really uh, a couple of areas that we're investing in. I would say uh, the area that we've invested a lot is price performance. And, you know, that will be covered a lot uh, within the Aqua session that we'll be talking about shortly. Uh, we also uh, been investing a lot in the lake house architecture, making sure that any customers can create any type of data um, and you know integrate with other services. So that's part of uh, what we'll be discussing about the super data type. And then last but not least, uh, it's also as part of a lake house architecture, it's really important to be able to share your data uh, with multiple different uh, Redshift clusters as well. So we'll touch upon uh, data sharing. That's also uh, one of the most popular services that we've been seeing recently. Mm -hmm.